In this episode, I'm once again joined by Gregory Blan, mystic, artist, author, and initiate of the Inayati and Halvati Jarahi orders of Sufism. Gregory discusses his latest book on the remarkable life of Lex Hickson, aka Sheikh Noor, the influential American mystic, author, and broadcaster who was initiated into several of the world's mystery traditions and was a key figure in interfaith dialogue. Gregory recounts his own encounters with Lex Hickson and reveals why he decided to write a biography of his old friend and colleague. Gregory also discusses the heart of the Quran, the power of the feminine, and why Swami Vivekananda said, American women will be the salvation of the world. Gregory and his wife Sylvia end the episode by singing two Turkish ilahis of the Sufi tradition. So without further ado, Gregory Blan. Gregory Blan, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you. Good to be with you. Uh, it's a delight to be talking with you again, and uh, may I congratulate you on the publication of your latest book, Living Open Space, The Interspiritual Journey of Lex Hickson. Yeah, well, it's, uh, it's a book that uh, has come uh, 20 years after the passing of Lex Hickson. And I, I don't know if he's uh, as well known as I think maybe he should be because he was an interspiritual pioneer uh, even before we were, I think, mostly were using the word interspiritual. And uh, I've always been attracted to all of the different religions as I'm, I'm sure you have as well. And, uh, you know, uh, my uh, path originally, uh, when I got into Sufism, I studied with Pierre Valayat uh, Khan for 10 years. And, um, but before I took hand with Pierre Valayat, um, I became aware of Lex Hickson as a radio host of WABI in New York. And he had a very popular radio uh, show. And the, the format was, uh, it was several hours in length and he would interview the the guest and play music or have chanting and would actually ask them to uh, lead practices uh, on the air and very inclusive of the audience. And uh, it, it became a very popular show. So he had uh, all of the, uh, of the great uh, teachers that were uh, coming to uh, the West at that time. And this is uh, the early 70s. Um, Alan Watts and Krishnamurti and uh, Mother Teresa and uh, Rabbi Zalman Shakhtar and uh, many uh, Buddhists, uh, Hindus and uh, Christians, just uh, thinkers from all walks of uh, life, basically. And so uh, when I first uh, met uh, Musa Farafendi in 1978, uh, he came to America with uh, a lot of his dervishes and I uh, traveled to West Virginia and uh, attended that. And at some point in, in that uh, weekend, it was announced that Lex Hickson had interviewed uh, the Sheikh on WABI and that the interviews were available um, on uh, cassette tapes at that time, and that he had also written a, uh, his first book, which was a spiritual compilation uh, entitled Coming Home. And part of it was based on his doctoral thesis. He had uh, uh, gotten a doctorate in comparative religion at Yale. And, uh, and so this is a, a very wide ranging uh, book with, with various essays, uh, uh, includes things like uh, Plotinus and the uh, ox herding, uh, um, the uh, chapter on uh, Ram Ramana Maharshi and uh, Heidegger, uh, all kinds of, uh, of different uh, things, the uh, Jewish Hasidic movement and uh, Baba Mahayadin, who was one of his first uh, Sufi teachers. So he had studied with uh, Babu Mahadin, who is another very uh, famous, uh, um, I, would, I would say a, a saint, uh, a, a, a spiritual giant who came from Sri Lanka and lived to a very advanced age. And um, 
Lex interviewed him uh, numerous times and, uh, and had a very deep relationship with him, but he hadn't really uh, been involved in uh, Islamic Sufism in the dervish path, so to speak, because Bawa was really kind of, he, he taught uh, both Hindus and Muslims and, and was extremely universal uh, at that time when Lex was studying with him. So uh, I uh, ordered these, uh, these recordings of uh, Muzaffar Effendi and the dervishes and, and, and heard all their beautiful uh, uh, Turkish hymns we call Ilahis, um, which it means divine song. And uh, the interviews, and I was very, uh, very much impressed and uh, read Alexis' book. Uh, this was in the days before the internet, and so uh, must have been part of the divine plan. I never actually got back with uh, Muzaffar Effendi in this lifetime. I, I would always hear that he had just come to New York or was about to leave or something. But uh, I was already studying with uh, Pierre Belayat and, and had my hands kind of full. Uh, with, with that Sufi curriculum. But in uh, 19, uh, 1988, uh, Lex uh, published another book called The Heart of the Quran. And uh, in that book, he uh, paraphrases uh, the Quran and does meditations and, and it's a sort of a a top seer in which he expands the verses to, to make them much more accessible to Western uh, audiences and, and um, imbues a very loving tone to it that is really present in the Quran, but uh, we, uh, we don't see it as much when we see the English literal translations. So I was, I was very uh, turned on by that as well. And, uh, and I um, found that Lex had been uh, interviewed again by another uh, interviewer, um, Michael Toms out of San Francisco. He had a, a series for many years called New Dimensions Radio. And at that point, I found out that, that Lex uh, had uh, actually become a, a Khalifa or a representative, a sheikh uh, in, in the uh, uh, in the Helvetti Jarahi order of Muzaffar Effendi and was representing him. But uh, he, he wasn't doing it out of a, a narrow sort of Islamic focus, but was very universal. And uh, he had translated uh, some of the Turkish hymns into English. Uh, and Lex was uh, a very poetic soul. And so he had a very beautiful uh, uh, turn of phrase and, and could really beautify uh, these uh, these hymns in English, and, and they weren't always strict translations. Sometimes they were the inspiration uh, that was coming through him. And uh, I think the secret of of his uh, part of his appeal uh, and his depth uh, in the uh, embrace of so many different religions was not only his exposure to all these teachers and having taken uh, initiation in a number of different paths and actually studied them uh, very uh, intensely. But he um, had really fathomed the, the essential universal uh, source behind all of the religions. And when he... Um, but on the dervish path, he saw uh, straight to the to really the heart of the tradition, and so some of the uh, the uh, the more parochial features of Islam that we might uh, not be attracted to so much uh, were not his concern. But he was really uh, seeing that that Allah is not a uh, a separate being somewhere transcendent, but actually the heart of creation and the, uh, the source and goal of all being and that everything, uh, when, when, the, uh, when Muslims say, la ilaha illallah, nothing exists but God, this really means uh, that even ourselves uh, do not exist apart from 
of this divine milieu. So we are, um, we are really uh, embraced by divine love. And, and he found this in all of the past. And it, it was, I think, a very ecstatic uh, uh, emotion for him to realize uh, to, that in each of the paths he was finding the same uh, fount of uh, beauty and wisdom and, and that um, really d discovering love as the basis of, of the universe, that the whole creation has uh, flowered and come into being out of an act of, of love. There's a, a hadith of the Prophet Muhammad where, where uh, God speaks to him and says, I was a hidden treasure and longed to be known, and that's why I created creation. And so this means that the physical world is the, uh, the place in which souls have the opportunity to uh, bring through the divine um, consciousness. And so if, if, um, if pure consciousness is um, at, the, at the root of our uh, individual personal consciousness, it means that we can also uh, uh, have access to uh, some part of the divine consciousness and that we uh, have a, we could say a divine spark in, in, our, in the hearts of each one of us that can be brought out. And part of the um, teaching and, and understanding of Sufism is, is that um, we don't recognize our, our uh, divine inheritance sufficiently and that our, uh, uh, our ego self uh, stands in the way and sort of blocks the divine light from coming through us. But when, if we can purify the heart uh, that can come through more and more. And so that's why the uh, Sufis use the, all the divine attributes of Allah to uh, uh, bring out these qualities in ourselves. And, and so each of us is a, a garden of divine names that uh, can be um, actualized. And, and uh, interestingly enough, the goal uh, of, of Sufism is to become fully human in the broadest sense of the word, of, of bringing out the divine potentialities and uh, also to uh, feel the, the, the beauty of the of physical world and to see that we're surrounded by that. So uh, Lex uh, started out, his, first, his uh, parents were not very religious. Uh, they were uh, nominally Christian. They were very uh, wealthy, uh, lived in California. And, uh, and Lex was uh, intrigued by the different religions that he encountered, but he hadn't really experienced them too much. And the first uh, uh, teacher that he really studied with was uh, uh, Vine Deloria, who was a um, Episcopal priest whose uh, uh, father had had converted. Uh, his, his grandfather was a, a, a sort of indigenous uh, shaman, and he had actually converted uh, and been attracted to the Christian way. He wasn't uh, proselytized, but but really um, found something uh, in the Episcopal way that attracted him, and so. Brian Deloria was, um, he lived on the reservation in, in the Northeast and Lex would go and visit him. And so he learned uh, some of the Lakota ways. And uh, so that was his first uh, introduction to uh, uh, religious teaching. And it was uh, typical of him that it, was, it wasn't it was just a, uh, a regular uh, priest or, or something, but, but one that, that mixed these two traditions. And uh, after that, he discovered uh, Ramakrishna and the uh, and the uh, and his um, consort uh, Sri Sarada Devi, and, the, um, and fell in love with the tradition of the mother goddess, and uh, really became very comfortable uh, with the images of Kali and so forth. 
And uh, as I'm sure you know, Ramakrishna was, was a very universal soul too. And he actually, uh, at different points in his life, embraced different uh, religious paths, the like Christianity and Islam. And, uh, and Lex really, I think that set the tone for his spiritual life, that and, and uh, Baba Mahayadi. <clears throat> And, uh, and so from, from this blossomed uh, uh, all of his other traditions, and uh, we, we can speak more about that. I didn't know if you want to uh, ask any different questions at this point. Yeah, of course, I, I have lots of questions. Um, you wrote, I, I'm actually very curious to ask you about uh, some of those mentor figures, and there are others, of course, Swami uh, Nikilananda from the Ramakrishna oh. order. Um, who said of Lex, you're like a ripe apple falling in my lap. I'm very curious about that. And also, uh, Bawa Muhayyadeen, uh, incredible uh, uh, saint, as you say. Indeed. I'm curious, you've written in the introduction of, your, of, of the book, uh, Living Open Space, it was only after 20 years of assimilation of Lex legacy that I felt ready to collect and weave together the rich strands in the tapestry of his spiritual life. And so I'm curious, before we uh, go back in, dive back into Lex's biography, uh, could you talk a bit about what inspired you to write this book and how, how that process was? You knew uh, Lex Hickson, also known as Sheikh Noor, uh, really rather well, and he made you a sheikh in the um, Haveti Jirahi order, as you pointed out, and you collaborated with him on reworkings in particular of Turkish Ilahis, those hymns that you mentioned. So you had quite a close association with him over many years. Um, can you talk a little bit about what inspired you to write the book um, and how that process uh, was? Yeah, the, um, the first book that I wrote was, um, I was trying to give over the, uh, the dervish uh, path of, uh, of, Suf of uh, Sufism as I had received it from uh, the traditions and, and from uh, my sheikhs. And so I wrote a, a large history all the way from the time of the Prophet Muhammad up to uh, modern times. <clears throat> and uh, the sequel to that was the uh, a biography of Musafir Effendi, who was uh, Sheikh Noor's uh, uh, mystic guide and Sheikh. And so those uh, I, I, you know, only knew, I only met uh, Muzaffar Effendi a little bit, but uh, I, I inherited a lot of uh, archives and recordings and, and teachings, and, and so was, was able to really uh, delve into that uh, biography in, in a way that uh, I, f I found. I learn a lot when I'm writing these by you know, researching these teachers, and uh, it's, it's a, a joy to share that uh, with, with people who uh, may not have access to some of those uh, teachings. But uh, so those two books, I was giving over uh, Islamic Sufism as I had uh, um, learned it in as faithful a way as possible. But I really uh, felt drawn to explore more of the universality of, uh, of the path and so I had three different teachers who were uh, ardent universalists, and, and they were uh, Pir Velayat Khan and uh, Rabbi Zalman Shakhtar, Shalomi, and, uh, and Lex Hickson. So I thought about writing about all three of those together as uh, intra-spiritual uh, universalist uh, teachers who were giving more contemporary interpretations and, and uh, renewing uh, the, the faith uh, as they, they saw it um, for our times. And so uh, I ended up writing uh, uh, my next book, uh, When Oceans Merge, about uh, Pierre Velayat and Reb Zalman and, and their, uh, the interface between uh, those, uh, the path of, of Hasidism and Sufism and the way these two teachers actually initiated each other. And um, in that book, I was able to give more of the uh, kind of far out uh, uh, contemporary uh, insights of these teachers that, uh, that I valued very much. And so Lex was one, who, or Sheikh Noor, 
who I knew only in the context of a, um, of a sheikh. And yet the whole time I knew him, he was traveling and he, he wrote a Ramakrishna book and traveled to India and he would be gone for a while, but then he would come back and suddenly he would be a sheikh again. But uh, <laughs> he would kind of uh, don a uh, particular uh, uh, vocabulary and, and uh, tune in to a different religion and, and keep those separate. And so uh, the, the two paths that I explored with him uh, due to a lot of uh, dreams that I had, I have a Christian background. And so I had a number of dreams of, uh, of uh, the uh, prophet Muhammad and of, uh, of Jesus and, and uh, quite a few of these. And so uh, we ended up actually collaborating on a couple of, uh, of the divine hymns, the Allahis, uh, uh, inspired by those because these Elahis have been uh, written over the centuries through the inspiration of the various dervishes on the path. And uh, for instance, Yunus Emery is, is one of the most famous uh, Turkish poets uh, who uh, we sing a lot of, of, uh, of the Elahis that uh, were fashioned from poems he wrote. So uh, we we figure there's no reason why modern uh, uh, inspiration can't come through in, in uh, new Elahis, but we, we continue to use the, uh, the Turkish tunes because they're so, so beautiful. And uh, so uh, the answer to what I decided was uh, for many years, I, I, I thought, I don't know Lex from all the traditions, and he had so many contacts and so knew so many people. Um, and so I, I was a little reluctant to assume uh, the, the, uh, that I would, would be able to successfully write about him. And so I waited uh, for years, waiting for someone else to write the book. And uh, it, it finally did. <laughs> finally inspired to, to go ahead and write it myself. I knew I had access to a lot of materials. And so in the course of that, I was able to contact a lot of uh, people that uh, were very close to Lex that worked in the different traditions. Uh, so uh, uh, like, uh, for instance, Robert Thurman was a, uh, a teacher of Lex's at uh, uh, Columbia. Of course, he's a, the the first American uh, Buddhist and uh, studied and translated with the, the Dalai Lama. Um, uh, Babaji Bob Kendler is another, he's a, a Swami uh, out of uh, Hawaii who knew uh, uh, Lex uh, very well and, and had a lot to share. And they actually did some tours together. And uh, uh, Babaji is a, a, a professional cellist who used to play with the symphony and uh, in Hawaii. And uh, so he formed a, uh, a, a group uh, that would sing uh, bhajans and, and uh, various uh, uh, Hindu songs to go in the Ramakrishna uh, tradition. And so he and Lex did a book tour all over the uh, country where they would uh, have this, uh, this little uh, uh, Hindu group uh, chanting and singing uh, uh, as a kind of ecstatic uh, uh, adjunct to uh, the talks about Ramakrishna. So uh, um, Sheikh Afariha, who is now the, uh, the uh, successor of, um, of Sheikh Noor, also uh, was uh, uh, willing to help and uh, they have a publishing company in New York, Pure Press, who published this. And, uh, and so anyway, there, there were many more uh, who, uh, as you can see from reading the book, who uh, enthusiastically volunteered and, and really helped uh, to make this uh, uh, almost like a, an anthology of, that covers uh, many of the different traditions of uh, Lex. And I wanted to write it not as Lex as the Sufi Sheikh that I knew, but uh, that, that's part of the book. But I really wanted to make this uh, about inner spirituality. And as I studied it more and more, I, I really began to see more and more the value of, 
uh, of seeing all of the religions, uh, the, the stories that they bring to the table, the, uh, the mythos, uh, you know, whether we take some of these stories literally or not, they are fundamental uh, myths and truths by which uh, large sections of humanity live. And uh, Lex believed that if we, that the new age uh, small groups were not the answer to transforming our culture, but that if the uh, institutions who had thousands of years of, uh, of, of history and, and mystical depths, if, if those were actually, uh, if the mystical depths of those traditions were brought out, that would be the uh, uh, yeast that would allow uh, a, a true spiritual awakening. And um, so in, in the book, uh, I cover as many of the traditions as I was uh, able to uh, learn about, but he, he um, there, there were, I, I'm sure I missed some, but I, I know he was, he was also into Christian science and, um, uh, and different, uh, he, uh, he interviewed a lot of uh, Hasidic rabbis and had a very, uh, deep connection with, uh, with several of, of the great uh, uh, Hasidic teachers, uh, Rabbi Shlomo Karlbach, who's a, a great musical uh, uh, rabbi, sing, sings very, uh, very heartfelt and ecstatic uh, um, songs in the Jewish tradition. And many of those have been translated into English also. And uh, the uh, the Sufis uh, in the um, in the Anayati tradition uh, of Pir Vilayat uh, Khan, uh, you know, will use those in, as part of their uh, service. And so, uh, Lex had actually four uh, major paths: uh, uh, the Vedantic path and the uh, uh, several Buddhist lineages. Um, uh, Zen, he studied with. Uh, uh, Bernie Glassman, who was a uh, Roshi, and um, he was also uh, in the uh, Galupa sect, uh, and uh, had uh, studied Vedanta and Orthodox Christianity, Eastern Orthodox, in, in the uh, Russian church. And so, uh, I bring all these together in the book and uh, the uh, two paths that uh, he really encouraged me in as a, uh, he was, he called his, uh, sometimes referred to it as uh, parallel sacred uh, universes or paths. And, and so he believed that, uh, he didn't believe in, in mixing and making a, 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 a amalgam of, of the religions, but, but really going into the mystical depths of each one. And so he, he felt from my dreams and my background and so forth that, that I, I really uh, should study the, uh, the, the mysteries of, of Christianity as well as uh, uh, Islam. So uh, those were the two traditions that I uh, studied uh, and, and mostly just studied Sufism with him. And uh, when he was at the mosque, he pretty much just spoke about uh, Sufism and, and didn't bring in these other things. But occasionally he would, he couldn't help but uh, quote the Dalai Lama or, or some, someone, uh, I remember him saying, uh, the, the Dalai Lama, I, I just recently heard him and he, he was saying that the spiritual path is to become fully human. What, what a great uh, way to express it. So uh, that is uh, really the, what, uh, what drew me to, to write this book about uh, his inner spiritual uh, journey. And, uh, and so I hope I've done it justice. We're, we're going to uh, do a, uh, a Zoom with uh, a lot of the uh, uh, teachers and, and beautiful friends that knew him well uh, and, and have a kind of uh, celebration of his life and the, the, the um, and, and this book. I've also put some of the, uh, some music uh, with recordings of Lex uh, on, 
on YouTube and, and a, a montage of uh, various video clips so people can actually uh, uh, get a better sense of that energy uh, other than just uh, reading uh, from the book. Where can people find out about that Zoom meeting and also these, uh, these clips that you're putting on YouTube? Yeah, we we have a, a couple of mailing lists we're going to send out to. Uh, I I could include you on that uh, if you wanted to uh, uh, include that. I, but I, I don't. I'm not sure exactly how to uh, how that will. It won't be universally advertised. I I don't think. But uh, <laughs> the other clips, if you just uh, put in uh, Lexixon or or put in my name, Gregory Bland, uh, you see my channel, and uh, I have. Uh, uh, put up uh, clips of uh, several teachers, Pierre Goliath and Reb Zalman, and uh, several talks by uh, Sheikh Noor. Unfortunately, he passed away in 1995 uh, of uh, colon cancer, and so it was taken away from us uh, rather young. And so, the videos we took were 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 not the clear digital uh, videos of today, but uh, it's still something of uh, of his, um, the feel of his character really comes through in those talks. Yeah, there's a lot of great stuff on that YouTube channel, actually, that oh, um, yeah. I haven't seen anywhere else. It's, it's great. Um, something you said uh, piqued my interest about the feminine, uh, what Lex called the feminine metaphor. And you, yeah. you, write, you write here that Lex states that, and now you quote Lex, having been raised in the environment of Jewish Christian culture, where the root metaphor for approaching the divine is masculine, my immediate response was surprise delight at the naturalness and evident power of the feminine metaphor. And you're going to say nearly 20 years after first encountering the great goddess tradition, he wrote that he was able to approach very naturally the beautiful black warrior of wisdom, the sword bearing Kali of the noble Tantra, not as destructive and dark, but as blissful and brilliant. Later on, you write, during the final years of his life, especially, Noor's concern with the emergence of the feminine became more and more apparent. Among, among Hindu devotees, he noted that Vivekananda, the famous disciple of Ramakrishna, had once been heard to comment, American women will be the salvation of the world. Similarly, Hazrat Inayat Khan had stated in the 1920s, I can see as clear as daylight that the hour is coming when women will lead humanity to a higher evolution. I'm wondering if you could say a little bit more about the feminine metaphor as Lex understood it and its implications. Yeah, I, I think that that uh, it was one of the, the lessons I really uh, felt that I wanted to imbibe from him was this uh, was being uh, more and more embraced by the uh, by the mother energy. And so uh, our uh, religions tend to be rather patriarchal and uh, a kind of top-down uh, thing, and and, and so uh, we find in the uh, indigenous traditions and in, um, in in Hinduism, especially the uh, the mother goddess is still uh, very much uh, revered, and and uh, the, and all of nature is is seen as. Uh, uh, a supportive being that uh, uh, all the uh, beings on the planet uh, draw nourishment from. And so um, we, we draw from, the, from Mother Earth uh, through the, the magnetism of, of the Earth that comes to us. And um, it's uh, uh, something that, that Lex, I think, felt very uh, passionately uh, about um, that the, especially in Islam was one of the traditions he felt really needed more redemption on that. And if you go back to the original sources, you see that the, uh, the prophet Muhammad was very much, uh, had a very beautiful attitude toward uh, uh, women and, uh, and, and really honored them. And uh, some of his, uh, his uh, wives became teachers in the community and were very uh, respected. Uh, and so it, it was uh, an, another couple of generations after that, that uh, the um, 
more of the suppression of the feminine uh, began. And so he, he was uh, anxious to redress that. And uh, there was actually a, a secret tradition in the uh, Shia uh, a branch of Islam that uh, the prophet's daughter, Hazrat Fatima, uh, was actually was uh, his secret halifa, his secret uh, um, transmitter of and was was sort of had a connection with uh, the uh, uh, with the women of Islam as and and so there was uh, th this was something in the Helvetic Jirahi order that it had always traditionally been male uh, sheikhs and the women uh, had uh, sheikhs but they would only uh, maybe teach privately with a small group of women. Uh, and so they sort of kept that separate, but uh, but Lex uh, was um, he wanted to bring Islam into the culture of America, and he recognized that this uh, the the uh, the feminine was was really a major part of of uh, the modern. Uh, spiritual dynamic and and that actually if you you look at some many of the uh famous teachers if you see them surrounded by their disciples it's it's like 80 percent women and there's some sense in in which the the feminine part of the soul is is actually closer to the creative energies because they, they give birth and are uh uh, men are, are, are all uh, in the male energy, let's say, is always to rise and accomplish and achieve and uh, maybe have dominance over things. But the feminine energy is more like the, the Tao, the, the, the water that slowly seeps up and uh, nourishes. And so um, that was something that, that Lex really wanted to uh, foster, and so uh, he he felt it was important that uh, Sheikh Afariha, uh, and also in New Mexico City, Amina Taslima, uh, both of those uh, led the, the communities, and so uh, Amina uh, particularly had studied uh, with with Lex for years and. Um, moved to Mexico City. She worked uh, as a newspaper reporter and uh, worked for the Bureau in, uh, 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 in uh, Mexico City and uh, developed a, a very uh, a large uh, community down there. And they uh, very beautifully integrated the, the Sufi uh, movement with the uh, indigenous uh, culture uh, that uh, is uh, in, in which they were working in Mexico. And so instead of just trying to impose Sufism, they, uh, they really uh, uh, actually symbolically went to the uh, 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 Virgin of Guadalupe um, uh, in, in her uh, uh, basilica and, and uh, uh, Sheikh Noor actually brought a, a relic of the Prophet Muhammad, uh, which was uh, uh, a, uh, a hair from the beard of the prophet set in a kind of a, a amber. It's a, it's a very beautiful relic. And so he, he, he brought that with uh, him and asked the Virgin's permission, spiritual permission to, uh, to bring Sufism there. And so they uh, have uh, every year, they make a pilgrimage uh, with the uh, other pilgrims uh, to uh, the, the uh, uh, to the uh, to the Basilica of the Virgin, and uh, even make Islamic prayers uh, right there on the, uh, the steps on the platform uh, of the Basilica, and uh, the people uh, are very uh, very open to this, and um, and so they also uh, brought in the the indigenous uh, uh, culture uh, of. Uh, of of music and, and so forth. So they, they sing, uh, they're, they're a lot of the Elahis uh, have a Mexican flavor. So they found out that in every culture, you know, if you're in Turkey, you, you sing Turkish uh, style. If you're in America, you uh, adopt more to the American style. And in, um, 
and in, in Mexico, uh, uh, more, more of that uh, um, romance and, and energy of, of the mother. And so as these two uh, women, Sheikha Fariha and, and Amina Taslima, uh, both uh, are leaders in, in uh, the group today. And after Sheikh Noor passed, uh, the, uh, they renamed the, the special branch uh, that had come through Sheikh Noor as the Noor Ashki al-Jarahi. And so this is in honor of uh, Nur means light in Arabic, and Ashki means uh, love or the lover, uh, and it was the pen name for uh, Muzaffar Effendi. And so these two teachers, they felt uh, were uh, really open to the modern world, very adaptable, and saw how Islam uh, can adapt to the uh, American uh, Western uh, culture and enrich it, actually and uh, has uh, a lot of uh, seeds of democracy in it. And of course, Islam is actually, uh, Sheikh Noor used to emphasize that it was uh, universal Islam and not uh, a, a, some Islam that was a separate ism uh, in conflict with other religions, but it, it is really the, the, the same message in a, uh, uh, in, in the form as brought through the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So uh, that, that energy um, of the goddess uh, really came through in the, the last two uh, books that uh, Sheikh Noor wrote. I actually have a couple of his books sitting here. He, he wrote one called uh, The Mother of the Buddhas and uh, the other one's called the, the Mother of the Universe. And these are uh, really uh, translations of, uh, of poems in, in the Mother of the Universe, uh, poems of uh, Ram Prasad and uh, uh, the Mother of the Universe is uh, uh, a sort of a Zen uh, a Buddhist uh, uh, teachings that have come down. And his uh, teacher, uh, Bernie Glassman, actually uh, suggested that, uh, that he write uh, this uh, translation. So the, the people uh, found that his translations uh, very often really opened up uh, some of the uh, meaning that was hidden in arcane translations. And uh, with uh, uh, the heart of Quran, for instance, uh, uh, Sheikh Noor used uh, a, a lot of uh, beautiful names for the divine, like uh, the uh, the source of being who is now lovingly communicating to humanity, <laughs> those sorts of phrases, uh, 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 the, uh, the source of love, the uh, absolute being itself, uh, to, to really emphasize that this is not some uh, supernal uh, deity who is separate from humanity, but is very much at the, at the heart of, uh, of all things. Mm, fascinating. What do you think Swami Vivekananda meant when he said American women will be the salvation of the world and uh, Hazrat Inayat Khan when he said that the hour is coming when women will lead humanity to a higher revolution? What, what's your take on what they meant with that? I think it's something that it's, it's going to take uh, a number of generations to really see the blossoming of it. But I, I think uh, th throughout the... Uh, 20th century uh, with uh, the, you know, in uh, before 1920, the women uh, couldn't vote in the United States, which was appalling. Uh, and, uh, and, and so we, we've won a lot of victories uh, that, and also in the civil rights uh, of uh, respecting uh, all people. And, and so the, the feminine has become more uh, has its voice has really uh, become more and more of uh, a force, and uh, we see many more women in politics. Uh, so far, uh, th the quality is not is not what I would like to see, but uh, I would uh, point to uh, Marianne Williamson as a uh, 
uh, a voice. Uh, I, I don't know what chance she would have of ever being elected, but uh, uh, really bringing the spiritual perspective into uh, the political realm, because uh, with all the, the inequality and the, um, as Willis Harmon said, our, our whole culture is, is uh, based on uh, an economic uh, uh, model in, in which everything is compared to the, you know, the bottom line of, of, of economic uh, a profit and gain. And this all seems to be sort of the greed that can be uh, attributed to the patriarchal, not to, not to the uh, fully realized uh, male human being, certainly not, but uh, it, it's a distortion of what uh, humans could be. And I think that uh, as uh, women become more and more a, uh, a force, the, the compassion, the natural compassion that comes through women uh, will bring this, this more spiritual and uh, uh, egalitarian sense uh, to our culture. Uh, of course, that's if we have time, uh, you know, we, we have a kind of ticking bomb with the climate crisis, but uh, um, one, one author that uh, it spoke to me deeply was um, speaking about how even the uh, invention of photography and, uh, and, and more recently the internet and uh, uh, visual images <clears throat> and even typing with two hands, uh, even though not, now most people are swiping. Uh, these are integrative things that mix the left and right brain. And so we, we've been a very uh, uh, a left brain uh, androcentric a culture and our religion has been couched in uh, in metaphors of of God as He. I remember Reb Zalman uh, saying uh, once he said, "Every time I say He, I I, I feel I'm, I'm lying to my deepest sense of, of who the the divine uh, being really is. It's it's very much a She. However, the language." at this point still limits us. We don't have a, a, a neutral word that uh, we can't, it doesn't seem like a, a good way or he, she seems a, a sort of uh, awkward way of, of saying that. So a lot of people um, have begun to use the, the feminine and the masculine uh, inner, uh, alternatingly and Rob Zalman uh, translated the, the Psalms and, and published that. And, uh, and so uh, uh, every uh, other verse would, uh, he would say, she for God and uh, he. And these are the sorts of small movements that began to shift our idea from, uh, from a, a, a kind of strict punishing uh, male uh, kingly metaphor to a metaphor of the beloved, of the uh, of the lover, uh, and, and of the uh, and that's much more I think in the in the feminine that uh, the, the soul really uh, is it becomes united with uh, with the beloved, and so that, there's really almost a, a, a metaphor of sexual union that's implied there but it's it's not a physical sexual union but it's it's a uh, it's a on a higher plane that uh, that we long to connect with our source and uh, and if we can visualize this source as a compassionate uh, uh, mother and maybe we didn't all have uh, real compassionate mothers but uh, the the ideal is still, stands uh, uh, and it uh, can be a uh, compassionate father as well but uh, a nourishing one uh, who uh, who really uh, uh, seeks to uh, bring out the, the the love that is in our nature so that we share it with people rather than uh, having a, a culture of haves and have nots 
Yeah, very interesting indeed. Speaking of punishment, um, Lex's uh, interspirituality was not always well received by his colleagues in those various traditions <clears throat> and mentors. You write, while the Eastern traditions such as Hinduism naturally tend toward ecumenical acceptance of other paths, the more orthodox Christian, Islamic and Jewish institutions and their congregations as a whole sincerely believe that they represent the only divinely sanctioned way and can neither tolerate nor fathom how one of their congregation could endorse pluralistic affiliations except as a misguided deviation from truth. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about some of the pushback or resistance that Lex received. Um, you recount one story in the book of being called in front of the church that he was attending, the Christian church by Father Hopko, uh, to be uh, disciplined. And indeed he was uh, censured for a period of time um, in that uh, group. Uh, could you say a little about that aspect? Yeah, well, th well that's where the rub is, uh, that uh, we uh, are between paradigm uh, shifts. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the uh, there's there's two different models uh, that are uh, uh, side by side, and they don't necessarily see eye to eye. And so the, this uh, sort of triumphalist spirit that has uh, has characterized many of the religions that we are the only way and have the only truth, and uh, and the other religions are are. Uh, of the devil or something like that. And even uh, it goes so far as to, uh, within the particular religion, uh, especially in Christianity, we had a, a real history of persecuting uh, heretics that uh, didn't uh, have the exact same uh, truth. And so, uh, you know, the, the church uh, split uh, in the Middle Ages over uh, one word, filio, uh, it was a, a word uh, of the sun in the uh, Nicene Creed, and so uh, I'm sure there was more to it than that. But but the, the idea they would they would uh, completely split over uh, over words, which is a kind of masculine uh, sort of uh, dueling sort of uh, way to approach religion. Uh, is indicative of that. And then once the Protestants um, uh, broke off from the, uh, the Roman Catholic Church, um, then they began wars with each other and were burning each other at the stake. And, uh, and we had the Hundred Years' Wars, all, all these uh, wars in Europe over religion. And, uh, and so, that kind of triumphalism, I, I think, uh, cannot uh, continue. I don't think that's, I think there, when the world was more localized and we didn't have international travel and internet and didn't know about uh, these other religions very much, it was easy to, uh, to sort of uh, uh, demonize them or, or think that they, they are just uh, uh, walking in darkness or something, but, uh, in our time, I, I think uh, we have to really understand. Uh, this is one of the reasons I, I, uh, I think Vatican II was such an important uh, um, movement in the in the Roman Catholic Church. The, that uh, that they were uh, in principle accepting that the other religions were paths, were legitimate paths uh, to the divine and. Uh, so this, this was an important step. And, and so I think the culture is slowly going toward that. In the case of Lex, uh, in uh, studying in, in Vedanta, uh, the, this ecumenicism was uh, fully uh, um, or mostly embraced. There, there are narrow people in every religion, including Hinduism, of course, but uh, the Vedantists uh, really, uh, have such a strong emphasis on on the unity and the uh, of the the oneness of of the uh, of the divine that uh, they they accept all the other uh, prophets and in Islam uh, in principle all of the uh, prophets are uh, accepted. 
And so uh, Muzaffar Fendi, for instance, was uh, even said, you know, that this could include uh, a Buddha. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't have to be just the uh, uh, prophets of, of Judaism and so forth. And um, when he was uh, with uh, indigenous people in New Mexico, he said, uh, these shamans are, are, you know, the, the equivalent of, of the of prophets of, of our tradition. And, and they're not soothsayers or, or some, you know, derogatory uh, a way of thinking about it. So uh, when, when Lex um, joined the Eastern Orthodox Church, he and his wife were, were very inspired by the uh, story of uh, 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 Saint Seraphim of Serov. And uh, they read a biography of him and they, they realized that the, the, there was a um, uh, Orthodox church and seminary right, uh, right near them in Crestwood, New York. And so they, uh, they went and found uh, a father, Alexander Schmemann and his wife, Juliana. Uh, and uh, Father Schmemann had been a uh, an important figure in uh, Radio Free uh, uh, Russia, and he was a friend of, uh, of Solzhenitsyn and, uh, um, and helped him when he came to this country. And he was uh, a teacher uh, in, uh, in Paris. Uh, and so he was, he was quite a, 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 a saint in his own right. Um, and uh, and so he, at the time they met him, he, he had actually uh, developed cancer and only had six months to live. And yet they were very at attracted to the Orthodox Church. Now, Lex was already a, a sheikh. Um, and, uh, and so it was a little scandalous on the, the, uh, the end of Sufism that he, uh, he was uh, suddenly following the, uh, the uh, Orthodox Christian path. But he found so much uh, confluence between the two paths. Uh, now, I attended uh, uh, St. Vladimir's with him a, a number of times. And uh, in the uh, Russian service, uh, one of the things, uh, there's a, a full prostration, uh, or, or it's a prostration exactly like the Islamic prayers. And uh, there's a, a kissing of the uh, of the hand of the bishop, and uh, and that's the same thing that's done in uh, with the hand of the sheikh. Uh, it's just a token of respect, uh, um, and that there is there are similar teachings of the uh, child of the heart and, and and various things from the early church fathers and mothers. That uh, so Lex was was rather amazed. He said, I, I, you know, I received some of the same teachings in Orthodox Christianity that I received from my sheikh. And there, there's a, a, a whole lot of uh, confluence between these, both of these paths originated uh, in, the, uh, in the East, Middle East. And so uh, at some point after attending uh, uh, Lex, of course, he, he went to Mount Athos and uh, did retreats there and, and really, imbibed himself in the tradition. But at some point he, um, it, I think uh, it may have been uh, Easter and uh, uh, the uh, Eid day of Ramadan fell on the same day or something. And so he needed to go down to the mosque and, and do, a, do a zikr there or something and then rush off to the church. Uh, and I think he, he must have had his uh, Islamic uh, robes on and, and was in a hurry and didn't have time to change. And he kind of thought, well, maybe this will blend in with the other priest or something. But uh, it became obvious to them that, uh, that he was uh, involved uh, in Islam. And so they, they called him uh, to... Uh, Father Hopko was... Uh, uh, teacher who, who he, he loved uh, Lex and he had, had been to his house and, and had seen, you know, all of the ecumenical, the, the um, things that were in Lex's house. But uh, I asked 
asked uh, Lex's wife, Sheila, and she said he probably thought, you know, he had left these paths behind for, uh, for a Christianity or something. So they, uh, they, they felt that the, um, if a Muslim was taking the, uh, the sacraments, the, the body of Christ, uh, somehow that might be uh, bringing in some sort of, you know, pollution or, or the energy that they were not comfortable with. And so he was, uh, his discipline was to uh, not be able to, uh, to take the, uh, the Eucharist. And uh, there's already a rub because that Eucharist is actually uh, wine and uh, Muslims don't uh, drink wine. And, and Lex didn't drink wine except in that uh, particular uh, sacred uh, setting. But even there, you you know you have an exoteric sort of uh, uh, conundrum, and uh, and so they they said you know well you could certainly continue to come to the services, but you you know you have to kind of repent of your way, and so he uh, he kept coming to the services, and uh, Juliana Schmemann uh, at some point after about a year stepped in and spoke for him and convinced him that uh, they, should, they should restore him uh, to the good graces of the church. And then he kind of quietly went back to uh, uh, being a Sufi sheikh at the same time. Uh, and so, I'm not, you know, I'm not sure from the church's standpoint exactly how that all uh, uh, was uh, integrated in their minds, but uh, uh, I spoke with Lex many times uh, about that. And, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, how do we reconcile uh, the uh, the dogmas of, of uh, Christianity and Islam that Jesus is the Son of God? No, he's a prophet, and, and so forth. And he uh, he really felt that that those questions were on the outer surface of religion, and that uh, uh, that. Islam accepts uh, uh, Jesus as the Messiah in, in the Quran and the Virgin Mary as, as his uh, uh, mother and respect. There's this great respect that a lot of people don't know about uh, when, uh, who haven't really looked into Islam. And, and so uh, the, as I was writing this book, I, I reflected on some of the questions I used to ask uh, 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 Sheikh Noor. Sometimes he would say, well, we need to bring in a, a third uh, force, you know, the uh, Ramakrishna or the uh, Buddhist perspective or something to, to really see uh, how uh, these things uh, all fit together. But I, I really came to the conclusion that, that uh, Nowadays, those uh, exoteric uh, dogmas and questions uh, aren't at all a problem for me. And so uh, I think it's something on the inner spiritual path when, when somebody tries to uh, uh, combine two paths at first, there's a kind of a cultural crunch and, uh, and a lot of questions and, and how do these fit together. But at some point, the understanding of the heart really prevails and one realizes uh, these are just two beautiful expressions like uh, water poured into two different uh, glasses or, or something that uh, have taken uh, different shapes in different cultures over time, but they are the, they are poured from the same uh, source and they're, they're drinking from the same fountain and, uh, and that each of them has a, a, a valuable a story, a valuable teaching that uh, is unique. So each of the religions, they, we, we don't want them to uh, go out of being and, and be replaced by something else necessarily. Um, um, it's, it's always, it's, it's like uh, Alex uh, compares it to uh, species of animals going extinct, you know, if, if a, a religion like, like for instance, 
Zoroastrianism used to be a very powerful religion, and there are still Zoroastrians in the world, but it's it's much reduced in, into the you know just hundreds of thousands of, of people rather than millions. But uh, the um, Christians and Muslims, uh, you know, are over a billion people in the world. So that's a really huge um, basis of uh, of religious um, longing that um, if their understanding could in incorporate uh, the, uh, tolerance for, for the other past as being different but authentic uh, past to God, then we would be in, in a much better state religiously. We wouldn't be fighting sort of uh, religious wars. Uh, and, and so uh, that's, uh, that was the, the main uh, story I was aware of where, where Lex uh, really uh, ran into the, uh, to the cultural crunch of, of religions. And he, he was, you know, he, he said, you know, I really respect, like if two Buddhist uh, uh, scholars would uh, debate inside the Buddhist uh, 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 world, they, uh, they could have a very beautiful uh, debate on, on points and, and they should argue for their, their points. Uh, but he said, it's not fair to try to judge say for a Christian to try to say Christianity is better than Buddhism or something when you're coming from a Christian culture that you've been indoctrinated you have almost Christian DNA you don't understand Buddhism like a uh, person uh, born and raised in it you know, we, we could say the same thing for other religions and so it does take time I think to uh, assimilate uh, these uh, these different uh, enzymes from the different religious paths. And, and sometimes you'll see that people will um, be fed up with the, with the sort of kindergarten approach of their own religious path and uh, throw it over and, and say, well, I'm, I'm going to, uh, I'm attracted to this other religion. And uh, Lex was always felt, no, you should, you, that's that's fine if you're attracted to another religion, but but uh, your birth uh, birth religion, it's important to come to terms with that. There's some reason karmically why you were born in that uh, religion, and there's something there for you spiritually that uh, will nourish your being. And and uh, if you if you haven't found that yet, you just haven't gotten to the depth of it. <laughs> yeah, you sum that up in the book with a quote actually from Lex directly. I'm an orthodox member of every sacred tradition. My one unorthodox point of view is that all of them are true. And so therefore they should share resources, but I don't think they should merge together. And that's this idea of interspirituality, um, where each uh, of the religious traditions, as you, as you said before, is not amalgamated into sort of Frankenstein, uh, but uh, his view is to, is to, 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 to leave them in their richness, but see the unifying underlying um well you you put it also the the finger pointing to the moon um yeah. of reality you said Do there are doorways to truth you you also wrote or musical motifs in a grand symphony these are some of the metaphors that you use to express this idea of interspirituality yeah um, the one that's really famous uh, the uh, the blind men and, and the elephant where they're all describing a different part of the elephant uh and uh, when the lights are turned on, they realize, or, or whatever that, you know, the story is told many different ways, but when they understand that it's one huge element, elephant, uh, uh, it, it, it really changes the way they, they think about it. They, they're not just grasping one part of it. Mm -hmm. You very kindly offered to sing uh, some Turkish Elahi, these hymns uh, that you worked on with Lex, and I would love to uh, invite you to do that. But before we do, uh, perhaps one last question. When you reflect on Lex now, it's been 20 years since his death. And you, as we've discussed, you, you knew him rather well and associated with him quite deeply in, in this sort of, in your own path. When you reflect now after 20 years and after completing this uh, fascinating book, 
what 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 are your thoughts now on Lex? How, how, where does he where does he live in your own life at this point? I think he's still uh, still guiding souls uh, in a very active way, and uh, I, I feel very connected with him. Occasionally, uh, he'll show up in a dream. The um, interesting thing about that was, uh, and, and I, I had it verified in talking to a lot of other people who knew Lex. During his lifetime, it, you know, like he used to come to uh, to Nashville where I live, and uh, and uh, uh, give uh, weekend uh, seminars and 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 lead zicker and so forth. And uh, myself and and others would would have really powerful dreams sometimes when he was sleeping under the same roof. And uh, some of the most powerful dreams I had uh, came through that way. And uh, I found it was it was so for many others, and uh, and we we all noticed uh, uh, after his passing, uh, almost everyone you know dreamed uh, about him uh, uh, very uh, uh, colorfully, uh, and then after after a while the dream started to taper off, and so. Um, now for myself, it's it's uh, occasionally so so he'll show up and and I'll say Lex, you're you're back alive. How, how did you do that? <laughs> so well, don't worry about that, and then we'll talk, you know. Um, and and so uh, yeah, I, I think in this book, uh, uh, actually I have it sitting here, so I'll show show it uh, to, to to people. Um, this is a picture I took of him years ago that we put on the cover. Um, I, I've, I've, I think that he uh, was happy with uh, with this book, and I, I had uh, a couple of dreams that, uh, that that gave me that impression that uh, he was behind it. Uh, I don't think it would have come together uh, quite like it, it did without uh, that, uh, with his blessing and and with really divine permission, because. He's one of many. There, there's there's many people now uh, who are uh, practicing inner spiritual uh, disciplines quite successfully, and so you can go on the internet and and really uh, see people in in every tradition. There's, there's a, a quite a movement of a progressive uh, a Christian tradition that uh, is uh, is is really. A, um, Really adopting a very broad uh, understanding of religion that, that goes beyond the sort of narrow uh, strictures of of the the salvation story and uh, of uh, that that have been traditional in the in some parts of the church, and so yeah, I, I think perhaps um, perhaps it's just a, a time to add another. Uh, voice to this uh, chorus of, uh, of, of rising uh, uh, universality and understanding because the, the world has become much more uh, connected now. There's not, uh, it's, it's not a time now for divisions and fighting among ourselves. It's, it's more a time for cooperation and, and for religion to be a uniting force that that teaches us compassion and tolerance, uh, and, and so this is part of the message that I see in uh, in Sheikh Noor, and the, and the fact that he was able to bring so many traditions into a beautiful vernacular uh, uh, with his uh, sort of poetic soul has um, has spoken to a lot of people, and, and so uh, Alhamdulillah, that's um, that's the way I see it. <laughs> And that book is Living Open Space, The Interspiritual Journey of Lex Hickson. Very beautifully written. I tried to, uh, in my books, quote uh, the person I'm, I'm uh, yeah. profiling as much as possible and put it in their own words. Uh, so it's, it's not everyone else's interpretation, but uh, yeah. uh, it's, it's good to, to hear how people uh, understood and reacted uh, to uh, the teaching, but uh, it's, it's good to to get uh, you know the the teaching exactly as as they were giving it yeah a lot of lex's voice does come through 
uh, in the text. That's that's very true. So these Turkish Alahis, can you say a little bit about what they are? And uh, if you'd be willing, perhaps uh, sing something. Yeah, and I, I was going to invite my, my wife uh, to uh, also join me. And she has a beautiful voice. Her name is uh, Sylvia. And uh, so I'll adjust the screen a little bit. These Ilahis were uh, uh, sung in Turkish originally, and, uh, and the, the dervishes under Sheikh Noor originally, uh, there, there was a lot of uh, Turks who were coming and, and they, they sang them in Turkish, but after uh, Lex joined the Orthodox uh, Church, he realized that the Father Shmeman had had many of them, of the, uh, of the hymns, uh, in Russian, translated into a beautiful English, and that they, that really worked well. And so, uh, in conjunction with his work on the heart of Quran and other uh, uh, things, where he was uh, bringing uh, translations into uh, uh, giving him his own um, his his own inspired uh, in interpretation and, and translation. Uh, he turned to the um, to the uh, Ilahis uh, with the blessing of uh, of uh, Muzaffar Effendi, uh, uh, who said, "Yes, by all means. You know, if this brings it more into the into the American culture, in, in, you know, why should you be singing it in Turkish if you if you speak English? Uh, put it in English." So uh, when I uh, joined the order, there was about 20 of these and, and Lex uh, visualized doing maybe uh, 99. I, I think he got about 89 done before, uh, uh, before he passed. But uh, uh, as I was a musician as well and, and had uh, uh, listened to a lot of these Ilahis over the years and was very inspired by them. Uh, I immediately uh, wanted to join the, the fray, and so I started translating some of those and, and uh, showing them to him, and he would say, oh, this is great, you know, I don't have to be the only one translating these, uh, I welcome others, and uh, so we developed a sort of collaboration where I would uh, find uh, these uh, beautiful Turkish tunes, a lot of them that were favorites of Muzaffar Effendi uh, that, that Lex knew as well, and uh, we had uh, a number of, of people in the order who could translate uh, from Turkish to English. And sometimes I would actually find them uh, in print and uh, translations. And, and these translations would, would often be very rough, literal translations. And so I would uh, reformat them to fit the music and, and, uh, and then hand them off to Lex. And then he would usually uh, uh, change a few lines, and um, sometimes he would, uh, you know, use mostly what I had uh, written, and, and sometimes he would uh, throw it all out and write a whole new uh, verse with his own inspiration. And uh, so uh, I thought we would sing a, a couple. Uh, the first one is uh, a, a hymn called the, the Mystic Guide, and it, it, it has many verses, but we'll just sing about uh, uh, three or four verses and it's short, and then followed by uh, uh, another short Elahi called This Nightingale. And uh, I uh, put the words of that uh, in the back of the book, and I, I had uh, uh, preserved where, where he actually had written it out uh, originally and, and given it to me and, and put that in the book as well. And it, it seems like a very quintessential uh, a set of lyrics. And so, uh, it, uh, so we'll just sing uh, uh, for just a few minutes here. The mystic guide opens the way, brilliant space surrounds the soul. The rose of light, its petals divine names, blossoms in the grateful heart. The mystic guide pours the true wine, his tears of love flood the world, his blessed face 
sun golden crown, shining as the rising sun. My direction of prayer is your face. My victory banner reads all is me. Paradise is not my concern. Hell is not my anxiety. You are what they praise at the Holy Kaaba. You are what they seek at temples and shrines. I am free from every religion, crying aloud, Allah, Allah. Strive to become the true human being, one who knows love, one who knows pain. Be full, be humble, be utterly silent, the bowl of wine passed from hand to hand. Be the bowl of wine passed from hand to hand. This nightingale, stranger to space and time, has flown here from the garden of your heads and that abode is simply the friend, all divine face, gazing, gazing, this that's on me, comes for beautiful as longing grows, deeper and deeper, dervish singing, is now constant, nothing surpasses his passionate love. That's a couple of the um, of the uh, mystic hymns, and uh, uh, Lex was was very adamant. He wanted that last line: "Nothing surpasses this passionate love for the divine," and uh, that really expresses uh, the emotion that I felt uh, so often coming from him. Thank you. That was uh, wonderful. Wow, very powerful. So yeah, we, have, we have some of the some of those ilahis with with licks uh, and uh, many dervishes and, and uh, instruments playing on on the, the YouTube if you, you go and have listened. So wonderful. You hear some of the uh, ecstatic chanting. That's thank you, Gregory, and, and your wife also. What remind me her name? I didn't quite catch it when you said it. Uh, Sylvia. Her name is Sylvia. Sylvia, her yeah. Her name is uh, Jamila Oshki. Well. That's just terrific. And uh, thank you so much for, for offering that performance. And also uh, your book, uh, available now, Living Open Space, The Interspiritual Journey of Lex Hickson. Uh, Gregory Bland and uh, Sylvia Bland, thank you very much. Thank you. It's a pleasure being with you. And uh, my love to all of your viewers. Uh, may the blessing of God rest upon each one of you. And may God's peace abide with you. Amen. Thank you for listening to another Guru Viking podcast. For more interviews like these, as well as articles, videos, and guided meditations, visit www.guruviking.com.